Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our latest HashiCorp snapshot titled uh, VMware NSXT Automation with uh, Terraform, which will be presented by Grant Orchard, our senior solutions engineer. Today, Grant is going to show us how you can provide automation for both operations team and administration, uh, administer NSX. The application team that want to consume it as a service. I also want to note that this session has been recorded and the recording will be made available after post processing and usually within a day or two we'll send it to you. So today's demo will last about 15 minutes. To uh, uh, keep it to 15 minutes time frame, we won't have time to answer questions at the end, so please submit your questions throughout the demo via, via Zoom Q&A tab and we'll answer them to you too. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Over to you, Grant. Brilliant. Thanks, Marina. Uh, so look, yeah, we're really going to delve into, um, as we say there in our subtext, a prelude of this, right? 15 minutes doesn't give us a whole lot of time to really cover off uh, the full extent of what you can do with either Terraform or uh, NSXT. But we're going to have a damn uh, hot crack at that. So let's get on with it. So I've got four things really that we're going to cover off here. Um, number one is starting off around defining what a network is for you. Um, that's clearly going to be different within everybody's environment. Second thing we're going to look at is how we actually expose upstream dependencies. Uh, so when we're looking at NSXT, clearly you're going to have a set of core networking services that you don't actually want to make available to your downstream users. Um, configuration of your, you know, T0 router uh, or T0 gateway, as it's now called, uh, your NSX edge configuration, transport zones, anything like that. But these are a really important part of then configuring some of the downstream services. So how do we actually handle that relationship? The third piece that we're actually going to cover off is uh, how GitOps actually allows you to take a shared responsibilities model in here. So this is really around that delineation of, hey, I want to have a bubble that's my own network that I can control. Um, but how can we actually also provide the ability for the network team uh, and the architects to actually design that to, to basically check that the changes that you're going to be making are okay. And then finally, uh, we're going to be talking about how you can actually prevent implosions of production um, or for that matter, any other environment that really matters to you. So with that, we're just going to really get straight into it. Um, here's a super simple example, right? Um, Every network, every NSX environment is going to start off with a T0 gateway. That's just always going to be the case. And when we want to attach things downstream, there's going to be a T1 gateway that's connecting to that. Now, depending on what services you've actually got running behind that gateway, uh, you know, any of the decisions that you've made in your environment, you're going to have to think about, hey, uh, you know, do I want to have who knows, private networks. Maybe, maybe you're going to try and take the AWS cloud networking approach and bring that on, on premises. And you're going to say, hey, we want to have private networks. Anytime someone requests a private network, that's going to give them DNet capabilities going out, but no one's actually going to be able to connect coming in. Uh, similarly, you might actually have the idea of public networks where you're actually going to allow um, you know, SourceNet to actually you know, be enabled on that environment. Or who knows, maybe you actually want to do just straight routing. You're going to give people um, an IP range that's going to allow them to connect directly out onto the rest of your network, um, be visible, be routable, um, have route redistribution across the network. So all of these things and a whole bunch more really start to come into play when you're defining what your network looks like. So suffice to say that this is not going to be ever a one size fits all situation where you can just take a configuration from customer A roll it into customer B and, you know, everything is going to be like for like. So this is where Terraform really starts to come into its own. So what I'm going to do is switch gears super quickly and show you some code. So let's take a look at what this is. Um, first of all, we've got a resource here. Um, I'm creating an NSXT policy segment. And again, I'm using that idea of public networks and private networks pretty extensively throughout this. So we're going to define all of the attributes that are going to be required. And in fact, let me just demonstrate something really quickly for you. Um, one of the things that we actually released recently was the idea of a HashiCorp language server. And so what it's going to do is give you the capability to then come in here, create resources, uh, use type ahead to actually discover anything that, that should actually be part of a given resource to make that whole experience a lot easier for you. 
So let me just come down and as an example, start adding in, let's just see if I do a resource there, you can see that's auto completing. When I actually go ahead um, and bring up my options, it just gives me all the different capabilities that you might want to actually have within a given specific resource. Now, as an end user, um, someone who doesn't necessarily understand NSX, who doesn't understand the relationship between something like a policy segment, um, the fact that that actually needs to connect upstream to a tier one gateway, what a transport zone path is, this is gonna be all way too much. Uh, so this is where the idea of Terraform modules come into play. A Terraform module is just really a set of Terraform code, as you can see that we've actually got here. And what you do is simply expose it and say, hey, if you wanna use this Terraform code, just provide us with a few different variables. So let's have a look. This one actually does happen to be a module that I prepared earlier. And you can see here the different variables that are actually required. Now, private subnets, public subnets, we give them default values because you know, users might not always request these. Um, and in this case, it just means, hey, if, nobody, if, if somebody submits this with a blank value, we're just gonna pass through an empty array. So no networks will actually get provisioned. However, if they actually do um, provide a value through, then what we're gonna do is take a look at that variable, the public subnets, we're gonna take a look at the length at it, we're going to, uh, length of it, as in the number of networks that have been provided. And we're gonna iterate over that. And we're actually going to basically say, all right, here's the subnet that gets attached to the, to the segment. We're gonna make sure it's turned on. We're gonna make sure it's got all the connectivity that's actually required for this. Um, same thing here for our private, private segment that we've actually got going on. And you can see a few other resources that I've actually enabled as part of that, the NAT rule, the tier one policy group, um, and then finally, a gateway policy also. So this is all well and good. Um, let's take a look at what that looks like then on the consumer end. Here we can see how simple it is, right? Um, effectively, we pre-populate this top end here where we say what the module is that you actually require. And then the only inputs that our end consumer needs to provide us to say, hey, here are the private subnets that I'm actually going to be using. Here are the public subnets that I'm going to be using and that'll just go off and provision like magic. Uh, so let's look at a scenario now where uh, someone actually wants to go ahead and do this. Now, I've kind of pre-created this just ahead of time. However, it seems that somebody has decided that they wanna make a change to this particular environment that we've got set up. Uh, and I can see that if I come over here and take a look at my NSX self-serve GitHub repo, I can see that I've got a pull request sitting in here that's waiting to go through. So this was opened two hours ago by someone called Pandem. That happens to be Anthony Burke, if anybody in the call happens to know him. He's probably trying to throw my demo off cue, but we'll see what happens. So when the code is actually checked in as a, as a pull request, you can see what's happening down here. Let me just zoom in a little bit so you can get a, get a better visual on that. Now, this is actually going off to Terraform Cloud and it's running what's called a speculative plan. And it's coming back to say, hey, is anything going to break in effect? Is there any problem with this particular config? Um, is there any policy in place that says this should not go through? And it seems like things look okay. Um, so we can see here very simply, there's three things that he's adding, two things that he's actually gonna change as part of this. Uh, if I want to click on the details, that would actually change my context down into Terraform Cloud and show me what that uh, speculative plan looks like. Instead, what I'm going to do is merge this pull request. All right. Um, Berkey's change, I'll just put in here as my detail. Comment, confirm, merge. All right. So that has successfully gone through. So what I'm going to do next is just open up my Terraform Cloud environment and see what's going on. I'll come into my org. Let's take a look at runs that have started. Okay, so we can see that this Terraform NSX self-serve has gone into a planning stage. If I come in and actually take a look at that, thinking about it, we can see what's going on. Logs are coming through. We can see here that this is, all right, what is it doing? Hopefully this is showing up on screen all right for you. We can see that it's adding a route advertisement um, for a new subnet into the T1 gateway. Okay, that makes sense. Um, okay, he's creating an additional public segment. That also makes sense. So look, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna confirm and apply. We'll do YOLO, right? 
I only live once, what could go wrong? I'm gonna confirm that. And we're gonna try and find, all right, NSX, here we go. So it's saying there's nine segments. I have a sneaking suspicion that another one is actually gonna show up pretty soon. You might be wondering about the name choice here. So this is another one of those things that uh, you can do with a module, which is um, I've taken the decision to say, hey, if you wanna provide a prefix, sure, we'll use that to provision everything. Um, if you don't, then we're just gonna generate um, something within Terraform that we call a, a random pet name. Um, I've said to make it two words and it's generated easy sponge as our text. So everything that's got easy sponge is gonna be part of this particular, uh, particular element. All right, where's refresh in NSX? Down here, Oop, there we go. Okay, so that's just come up as, as simple as can be. It's pretty cool, and as you can see, what we're doing there is simulating the idea that Berkey's come in as the user, he submitted a pull request, right, because we're doing GitOps, and I, I take a look at it, I say, yeah, I think everything's gonna be all right, and I approve it, and it goes through. So that's one of our use cases. Now, the second one is, well, that's all well and good, but hey, Grant, look, what if, what if maybe, you know, you just fat finger something, you make a mistake or you look at that change and it's actually not something that should be going through. What can we do to prevent things? Uh, something that I hear super often when talking to um, customers managing on-premises environments is that they feel a bit of concern about taking something as powerful as Terraform that can effectively, you know, instantiate and destroy entire environments with just, you know, a few commands how can they wrap around some level of surety that no one's actually gonna just blow things up? So let's take a look at that right now. Uh, if we go back to GitHub and we come into our NSX core environment. Um, so our NSX core environment, let's just take a look at what's going on in here. So you can see we've got some data sources in here. We've got a resource for our uplink to connect our tier zero router upstream. Um, the tier zero gateway, which is then actually, you know, doing, doing that connectivity, the interface for it, the static route to say, hey, um, here's what our next hop is. In the real world, this would be BGP, home lab. So we're just talking about static IPs. Um, this is the kind of stuff where, you know, breakages are gonna bring down your entire network. Now, it just so happens that I can see another pull request. So do you wanna take a guess at who might actually be doing this? Probably Berkey again. All right, so let's take a look. Um, if I come in and actually take a look at the code that he's submitting, all right, he's saying upstead hardware. I, I assume he means upstream hardware configuration has changed. And what he's trying to do is push through a change to that next halt for the static, I, static IP route, uh, for the static route, sorry. Now, if we look at this cross, we can see that some checks were not successful. Um, and if I go ahead and actually take a look, we can see that something happened here whereby this policy hard check failed. Now, let's just assume I'm having a bad day. Um, I've you know, not paid attention to that little cross in there. And I just go, look, um, I trust Berkey. And I feel like that's the self-serve directory. Let's get rid of these controls so I can actually see what's going on. Brr. I'm just going to go back here and do it this way. All right, NSX core. Let's assume I just go, look, I, I, I've just missed that cross. I, I haven't noticed the fact that that's not successful, even though it's staring me clean in the face. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say, yep, all good, because, you know, I know some changes have, have gone through and been flagged there as a problem, but I know that we're making that hardware change upstream. So it makes sense that we should be able to do this. Maybe there's something wrong in the logic there. I'm just gonna say, go ahead and do it. Now, if I actually come back again in here, all right, come into my workspaces. Let's take a look at what's going on. We've got NSX core. All right, so that's taking a little while to merge in. We did pre-stage another one of these earlier. so. Let's actually take a look at what this policy is saying to us right now. Um, okay, so restrict changes to maintenance window has basically failed. Uh, so what does this mean? Yeah, there's nothing actually wrong with the code that's gone on in play. However, if we actually come across and find where I've put that policy example. Doom, doom. All right, here we go. 
let's maximize that one out. All right, so we can see here what's going on within this policy. Um, doing a simple import, so this is different to your standard Terraform code because Sentinel is basically evaluating all the changes that are gonna go on with your environment. So whenever you submit a, a plan, um, we're going to gather all of that information, um, any of your Terraform config, any of the variables and anything like that, that you're actually putting through. And we can read that in and basically do static code analysis to see if you're matching particular rules. So in this case, I'm saying, hey, maintenance days in my environment are Saturday and Sunday. I haven't put times in because I didn't want to overcomplicate it. I'm saying, let's load the time and let's bring it back in RFC 3339 uh, format, which is just this sort of format that's, uh, that's written up here. I'm adding 10 hours because it always returns it in UTC. And then I'm just doing a check to say, hey, okay, as a result is today within maintenance days. And in this case, no, because it doesn't happen to be Saturday or Sunday. So that particular request has actually failed. Uh, so that's an example of, you know, potential simplified business logic. If we wanted to do things like restricting IP ranges, say Berkey came in and said, hey, I want to slash 19 um, as part of a routed network. What we could do is just have, again, here, this idea of here are your allowed ranges. We're going to go through all of your code. We're going to look for segments. We're going to match those subnets against the permitted ranges. And then assuming that it actually goes through, okay, you can provision, but if it doesn't, we're going to stop you. So with that, we're coming up to the end of our time. Uh, so I would just like to say a really quick thank you to everybody for, for jumping on. Um, Marina, back to you. Looks like Marina might be on mute there. So allow me to just quickly come in and give us a close out here. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Thank you for the presentation and demo grant. Um, just a, a letter letting everyone know that you, if you still have any questions, you can contact Grant directly by the contact details shown on your screen there. Um, and that brings us to the end of our session today. We hope you find it useful. As mentioned earlier, this session was recorded and we will make the recording available on our website soon. I will also send, uh, we'll also send an email to everyone uh, who registered with the link to the recording. If you like what you heard today and want to learn more about VMware NSXT automation with Terraform, I encourage you to uh, check out the Learn pages on our website, which you can find at learn.hashicorp.com. And don't forget to register for our next snapshot, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love PKI, which will be held on the 7th of July. And uh, thanks again for everyone for joining.